Uh, ever the teacher, what was my takeaway from session one? Oh, a bazillion years ago. Yeah, I know. Yesterday afternoon. Takeaway for session one. <laughs> takeaway for session one. Your basic grid interprets tremendously how you interpret facts. And I talked about three basic grids for understanding providence. And I have my preference among the three, but my point is to help you understand that people with different grids of understanding what providence, sovereign, freedom, and such mean will interpret the same facts in very different ways. That doesn't make them ungodly. It just means that they're coming from a different perspective. And a big, 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 big takeaway from that, I hope, is in, when hell breaks loose in your church, as Ryan titled that session, real, real, real important thing is to go back to Psalm 23. And what is the hope according to Psalm 23? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what? Thy, whoa, that's not what I wanted. I, so, we go back to Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. God is with us. God cares. The basic lies of Satan. Uh, you don't need God. You're too filthy for God. You can't trust God. Three basic lies of Satan come through in a lot of different forms. The reality is God is present. God loves us. And yes, we are dirty in certain points, but God is still with us because of his grace. Really, really, really important takeaway. And uh, that will help you walk through the deep waters because they will come. Um, I talked uh, this morning on spiritual warfare, and there's a, a couple of takeaways I wanted from that. One of them is the idea, what are the two kingdoms? Darkness and light. Which one are believers in? Light. And never, ever, 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 ever compromise that principle of authority that says we are in the kingdom of light. I go through the story from last night, but it kind of stands on its own. I should do that, shouldn't I? Ministry of word and spirit before I go on this. What's the, what are the basic ways to do ministry of the word? I give you a four-step process for ministry of the word. Have Mary read her Bible out loud, simple interpretive questions. Why do I want her to do that? so that she is interacting directly with the Word of God, not with me and not with other things. I want her to hear the Word of God because I deeply believe that Holy Scripture is God speaking. It's not just a record of what God said in the past. It's not just a book of ancient wisdom. Holy Scripture is God speaking. And I want her to get at that directly in a very personal kind of way and receive this, the word of God deeply into her spirit. That's the ministry of the word. And I also talk about ministry of the spirit, which is revelation speaking of God beyond Bible. And some people don't think that happens today. I do. Uh, and what's the basic way? I gave you a couple of principles to get at that. And they're what? Mm, what? Have them pray, give their confession. And what is confession? Truth. Truth from the heart is an I statement. Confession to Jesus directly, not to me as priest, so there's a time for that too. But speak it directly to Jesus. And there's, some, there's a different dynamic that happens when you confess to Jesus or to Father or God, whatever. Uh, and then what? So you speak directly to Jesus, directly to Father, whichever. A father is good. Then what? Yeah. And then I, there's another thing in there I want you to say too. Ask him what he wants to say to you. 
inquire of God. It isn't necessarily going to happen. God doesn't always speak, but it's amazing how often he does in those kinds of moments. And I, I've, I've come to the spot where frequently I will ask, let's just stop and see if there's something that God wants to say to us in this, in this moment. And I just tell them up front, you know, you may not hear something, but you may. Let's just see what happens. God may have a special word for us. This is the inquirer of God. And I've discovered incredible power, incredible power for healing and restoration when I put those two together. And I just, gosh, I've got some stories. And the, the fun thing for me, I've had this happen several times in the recent past, is when God steps in really deeply, uh, especially men, it seems, start sobbing so hard that they're dripping snot on the floor of my office, and they don't care. It's an amazing phenomenon to watch. And because, uh, you know, men are not usually quite that vulnerable. And I, it just, I, I, this is amazing. Look what you're, I don't say it, look what you're doing. You're dripping snot on my carpet. <laughs> <laughs> but when God goes deep, he, he goes really, really, really deep. So if I look at a passage like Hebrews 4.12, you probably all know it. Uh, the Word of God is living and active, uh, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intents of the heart, which says it goes in really deep. The Spirit's Word cuts. But verse 13, And nothing, no creature, no being, is hidden from his sight, but all are, what? Naked, without covering. That's like Adam and Eve back in Genesis 2 and Genesis 3. Naked and exposed. And that's what the Word of God does, whether it comes from Scripture, from the direct speaking, is it exposes, takes away the shields and the covering, goes directly to the core of who we are, and that word that's exposed there, it's actually a word that sometimes in Greek refers to the sacrifice. That in the sacrifice, before you perform the sacrifice, you expose the neck by pulling its head up before you sacrifice it. It's that kind of exposure. And of course the whole point is, if we are followers of Jesus Christ, Jesus has already exposed himself and become our sacrifice. We don't have to worry about having ourselves cut up and sacrificed because Jesus is already the sacrifice and we rest in the sufficiency of his work on the cross and his newness in, in resurrection life. But that's what the word God does. It goes past the barriers, past the, the facades, past the uh, deceptions and goes directly to the spirit, whether it comes by word or the direct speaking of the spirit. And that's what we're after in the ministry of word and spirit. And it just does amazing things, amazing things. And then the other thing to do in that, and I, I think I mentioned it, but I'm not sure, uh, is, I, I think I, yeah, I did, because the Raise Your Hand song, is to receive that very consciously, Lord, I receive that truth into myself. On the other hand, when you get an accusation from Satan, bridging into what I did earlier this morning, you need to reject that. Our conscious action to receive the Word of God, whichever form it comes in, or to reject the accusation of the world, the flesh, and the devil, I think is important. So when we, uh, when we get a word from God, whichever, whether it comes through Scripture, another person, or that still small voice, whatever you call that, we need to consciously, oh, I receive that into, your, into my spirit. If it's not the Word of God, I think we need to say, I reject that in the name of Jesus Christ. Do it very consciously and very decisively. Because what happens, that accusing voice, wherever it comes from, will say, you went out and witnessed yesterday, didn't you? Yeah. Wasn't very good, was it? Yeah, it wasn't very good. You're really bad at this, aren't you? Yeah, I'm terrible. What'd you just do? You received a lie into your spirit. And that will now shape your attitude and behavior for a long time. Next time an opportunity comes up and you have opportunity to speak the hope in Jesus Christ, I ah, better not. I'm not very good at that. I'll just mess it up. How come? Because you receive the lie in yourself. So what do you need to do? 
as you discover that kind of a lie for which you've received, you need to go back to that moment, especially by the power of the Spirit with the help of a, of a priestly friend, go back and identify when you receive that into your spirit and reject it in the name of Jesus. That's not true. Jesus is with me. He will give me the words. He will empower my words, even if they're foolish, as I speak the truth of the hope that's in me. So that, that's an important piece in, in the, what we call ordinary spiritual warfare. This isn't demon uh, direct attack. This is just the everyday stuff where our sins and flesh get involved. Um, another piece, there's a great line. Jeff has been keeping nuggets um, since I'm staying with him. I've only got five nuggets and I need six or I've got to sleep in the doghouse tonight. So another nugget, Jeff, uh, is uh, when you come into dealing with a demon, uh, demons want to talk a lot of times. I just don't talk to demons. I'm not interested in anything they have to say. Uh, so what I will do is say to a demon, in addition to what Jesus said to the demon, I will say to the demon, my boss beat up your boss, get out. That's the, and that's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. My boss beat up your boss, get out. And, and it wants, but I can say, no, nope, my boss beat up your boss, get out. That's the end of the story. And you just don't accept any compromises. Uh, because it does not have the authority. Demons do not have the authority to be there, to sit there, and to empower our stuff or to accuse us of, of sin or whatever. They just don't have the authority to do that. So I do that. Uh, I'll take a question or two before I talk about the actual topic we're supposed to talk about in this session. To distinguish flesh from demons? Yeah. Or, yes, definitely. Um, yeah. Uh, flesh, uh, is, that's another word for sinful desires. Those are, that's me. That's my stuff going. Demons are actual personal beings that are evil, hate Jesus, and want to take me down. They want to shame me. They want to destroy me. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. My flesh is not trying to kill me. Demons are. And the way the difference is, demons are personal beings other than me. And when I start dealing with them, they will start reacting as another personal being. My flesh doesn't do that. And uh, there's some real similarities because they're all on the same team. I reject you in the name of Jesus. But you've got to deal with a demon as a personal being and command it to get away. Uh, I remember a demon, I don't think Christians can be possessed in the sense that uh, we're never owned by a demon. They never have a, th a legitimate authority over us. But we need to come at them the way Jesus does. They're, they're personal. They're not just my own desires that get out of control. Yeah, good question. A couple others? Yes. Okay, what do I do to prepare myself for the kind of battle that we do? Well, first of all, recognizing it's not my choice as to whether to be in battle or not. You know, I signed up for the love boat and woke up on a destroyer. You know, general quarters sounds at 6 a.m. I didn't sign up for this. Yeah, you did. Uh, we are in warfare. We don't have that choice. The question is, in what way will we prepare for that warfare? And I think the real, real critical thing is to come back and consistently remind ourselves of the authority we have in Jesus Christ. We are sons of the Most High God. We are children of the God of the universe. We are, we are coming by the blood of the Lamb, the exalted Lord who has triumphed over every authority. And when I look at, Col at like Colossians 2, it says, uh, God, uh, <clears throat> can I get it? I memorized too much scripture. I can't look at the wrong translation. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us how much sin? Colossians 2.13. 
all sin. Well, it's all the sin we've confessed, right? It's all the sin we've confessed. You hope not? Yeah. <laughs> it really is all sin. At There's sin that impacts us at a relational level. That's what 1 John 1, 9 is talking about. But as that child of the Most High God alive in Christ, all sin has been dealt with. All of it. And when it says he canceled the written code, the written code is the law that makes sin sinful. Uh, there's a double meaning here. ESV has it as the record of debt. And that's the record of the sins that we've committed. I think Paul purposely uses a word that carries both meanings. And uh, the, the cancel the written code, it's canceled with its regulations. The very code that made sin sinful is taken out of the way. We're not in that dominion of darkness anymore. We're in light. All sin is forgiven. What did Jesus do with all that? Nailed it to the cross. Boy. So he took it away and nailed it to the cross. And that next one, verse 15, is really important. What do you do to the powers and authorities? All the demonic realm, everything that's said against Jesus. He what? They're disarmed. They have no authority. He made a public spectacle of them. There's an interesting word study there you probably know if you've dealt in the passage. But the point is he exposed them what they are. They're just demons. My boss beat up your boss. Get out. You're only a demon. I don't mean to downplay demons, but they pretend to be a lot more powerful than they really are. Uh, we have the authority in Jesus, and he triumphed over by the cross. So then what's the command? Those are all facts. What's the command in verse 16? Who, who is most likely to judge me? Who is most likely to to judge me. For me, it's me. I'm way more likely to shred myself because I know more about my own garbage than anybody else does. Sherry knows a lot, but she's not a good judger. Uh, and other people will, demons will, that kind of stuff. Don't let anybody speak accusation into your life. Don't do it. The Holy Spirit convicts and other Christians will convict. Ryan did a great job. Didn't he do a great job this morning? Man, that was super. Uh, the Holy Spirit convicts, but it's always a restorative process. Accusation is for destructive process. Satan is out to kill, steal, and destroy. And we've got to reject those things. Let no one judge you unless they begin from the perspective that all sin is forgiven the law code that makes sin, sin has been canceled, nailed to the cross, and the powers and authorities are disarmed in Jesus Christ. That's the kind of stuff to be prepared for. Stand firm in the truth. And then just the, there are some techniques you can learn. The handout I gave you has some good summary. The next book up, as I would do it, is Clint Arnold's book. Uh, He's got actually two books, Three Questions on Spiritual Warfare. Clint Arnold teaches New Testament down at Talbot, good friend. Uh, he's got a book called Three Questions on Spiritual Warfare, something like that's in the Baker Three Questions series. And I think it's really good. Of course, I don't agree with everything there. I don't agree with myself half the time. Uh, and then he also has a kind of theology of the powers written at a like a collegiate level, which is called Powers of Darkness. And then Clint has also written just superb commentary in Ephesians that just came out from Zondervan. Clint's a just a very, very godly man and, and a very fine New Testament scholar and very discerning in this area. Some of you who want to get more of my trash <laughs> can go to uh, biblicaltraining.org. Uh, biblicaltraining.org uh, that, that website is uh, Bill Mounts who's a friend and very fine Greek scholar uh, maintains this and it has a lot of stuff a lot of very 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 good teaching on there that you can get free 
and download it. And I have a 10 clock hour uh, teaching on spiritual warfare there. Uh, Timothy Tennant, who's president of Asbury, has some outstanding stuff on world religions, just absolutely outstanding. Uh, but there's a lot of other stuff on there too. So it's just a good resource. And most of the stuff on there is free. The stuff that they have for sale for certificate stuff uh, is quite inexpensive. Uh, but it's a great resource and it has good stuff there. Now, what are we talking about today? Part, partnering with the world. What in the world does that mean? I thought we were supposed to have nothing to do with the world. Uh, isn't that like worldliness? You know, anybody that's friends with the world is no friend of mine. First John doesn't say that. Well, world is different meanings, of course. And the passage that I found myself thinking about as I was putting this thing together is Jesus. Not a bad example to follow. And this is what Jesus is. This is in Luke chapter 5. After Levi, the tax gatherer, Matthew is his other name, uh, he gets up and follows Jesus. And I found this really interesting. Levi, now again, who is Levi? He's a tax gatherer. That means he works for the IRS and is a really nice guy who's deacon in your congregation, right? No, no, no. What are tax gatherers in that world? They're crooks. They make their living by corruption. They're collaborating with the incredible oppressive Roman Empire. They're traitors. They're corrupt. They're the worst of the evildoers. They prey on people. Uh, they're just bad people. So what kind of friends does Levi have? Bad people. And he throws a great banquet for Jesus at his house. A large crowd of task gatherers and others are eating with him. The pastor of Grace Bible Church and Manhattan Bible Church and all those guys were complaining. Why do you eat with tax gatherers and sinners? It's a really good question. It's a really good question. And the question that we're asking here is, will we, as followers of Jesus Christ, eat with, collaborate with, work together with, tax gatherers and sinners and the simple answer is no we want to be pure we want to be like the Pharisees and you say but I'm not a Pharisee yeah we all we all are because if I eat with tax gatherers and sinners like man they're they're just bad people and if I don't become like them I'm kind of put off by some of the trash they do we have a situation in Portland that's just risen here in the past oh, three weeks or so. It's been pretty interesting. Mars Hill up in Seattle, Mark Driscoll's church, is planting campuses, video campuses in different parts of the world. They have one in Albuquerque. Uh, they're starting one in Orange County. In fact, it's just started. And they, the one in Portland actually had their first service last Sunday. And there's quite a process there because that's like Wehrmacht moving into the neighborhood. I don't know what Wehrmacht is here, but in Portland, Wehrmacht is really close to the devil. Uh, it just, you know, try, try to get an exemption to put a Wehrmacht in your neighborhood, you know, and not only will they not give it to you, everybody will hate you forever. Uh, and Mars Hill coming in is, uh, it was, nah. Well, what happened was, when they came down, they wanted to go in inner city Portland, in the, in the city hub, because basically uh, Mars Hill is a city church, not out in the suburbs, but right in the hub of the city. Biggest problem, Tim Smith is a lead pastor there and, and a good friend. So before they came down, I said, Tim, your number one problem, number one problem be find a building. I mean, it's just really, 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 really hard to find a building where you can do church in inner city Portland. Ah, oh, it can't be that bad, he said. Mm, just you wait, I said. And they got down there and discovered very quickly, it's really, 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 really difficult to get a place where you can meet as a church. It's just, they looked at ballrooms. Uh, ball, when do ballrooms do their thing? Well, not on Sunday morning, typically. 
unless they're doing weddings. And a fair number are doing weddings, and they don't want to rent out on Sunday morning. Well, I found a ballroom, but they didn't have any parking and no kids' facilities. Well, you can't do church in a ballroom without some of those kinds of things. That didn't work out. Uh, they, they looked at several commercial properties, but you want to seat several hundred people. And movie theaters, I mean, they've got the seats, but they don't have the other facilities. Actually, the movie theaters in Portland are very willing to rent uh, churches. Uh, they're the owner of one of the big movie chains is a strong Christian. He gives preferential rates to Christians. But church and movie theater just doesn't work out really well if you're doing anything more than a Sunday morning gathering. They looked at that, and none of them worked out. They're really having a tough time. And they were down to the spot where they're saying, I don't know what we're going to do. They were actually debating the possibility of moving out of inner city Portland just to find a place to meet. Because the way that works out, they're going to launch with probably 250 people, they're guessing. Because there are a lot of people are podcasting Driscoll stuff. And then they intend to grow because they're missional. Well, what happened was there was an old church, Sunnyside United Methodist Church, 32nd Taylor, uh, inner southeast side of Portland, that had been a uh, community Bible fellowship, had been in there for a good while. They had left because the building was so run down. And a cult group, bizarre group of people, bought it. So how do cult groups get all their money? I don't know, but it seemed like they had it. They did some weird stuff, but couldn't get anybody to come to their meetings and finally gave up and sold the building in 2008. Why'd they sell it in 2008? <laughs> Stock market went down and the real estate market crashed. Well, they tried to sell it, but they couldn't. And so it'd been on the market for a while, and then somebody was looking for it, so it was off the market, and it came on the market about two months ago, or three months ago, and it ended up that Marshall bought this building, the old Sunnyside New Methodist Church. I mean, this is really cool. And because they had the resources to do it, it was quite a challenge because all the debt and government against it, it really took some very, very careful negotiation, but they were able to, to buy the building. That's all cool. Front page, front page of the Oregonian, about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, front page of the Oregonian, anti-gay pastor gets Portland pulpit. Oh my gosh. Friday morning paper. One of my former Christian friends who hates Christianity with a passion emailed me the article from the OregonLive.com site and just put a thing on a dangerous church. And he was serious. Anti-gay pastor. Mark Driscoll. Oh my, my. Called up Tim. What's the deal, dude? Uh, he had gotten some bad advice. Don't talk to the media. They're not your friends. So the reporter had called Tim, and Tim hadn't returned his call. You know, he's busy. He's a pastor. He's got lots of stuff on his plate. But he hadn't made that a priority. And it went in, and Steve Beaver, the, the reporter, uh, had no idea that this would be on the front page and has nothing to do with the headline. The writer does not write the headline. Somebody else wrote the headline. I still don't know who wrote the headline. Oh my gosh. Uh, now what do we do? And the, I mean, it was all written from the radical, pro-gay, anti-Christian perspective. And it was just absolute nightmare on the front page of the paper. Okay, what do you do? What do you do? Case study time. Well, what I did in Luis Palau, uh, Louis, or sorry, Kevin Palau, Luis Palau's son, who's well-connected in Portland, uh, we got a hold of Tim, and the Q Center is one of the gay advocacy groups in Portland, powerful group. Basic Rights Oregon is a statewide organization. The Q Center was named in this thing because their headquarters is not far from where this is happening. And uh, so we told Tim, because they said in the article, we're willing to talk to him, but it was kind of said with an edge. I said, Tim, you need to go to the Q Center and meet these people. Now, should he do that? Should Tim go to the Q Center, 
gay advocacy group, leaders in the LGBT agenda, and they're hostile to Christianity because they see Christianity as the enemy to their agenda of full approval for LBGT rights, marriage and all that, adoptions and such. Should Tim go talk to him? People vary on this. I mean, they really do. I think yes. Luis, or Kevin Plow thinks yes. And uh, so we coached him pretty carefully, and he called and made an appointment, identified himself, no subterfuge involved. I'd like to come over and meet you guys and hear your story. And, of course, they knew about the newspaper article. And they said, sure, come on over. So he did. And he went to the Q Center, went to them, and came in just by himself. You know, they went through the metal detector, made sure he didn't have any bombs or guns. No, they didn't. But I <laughs> uh, came in and introduced himself. Hi, I'm Tim Smith. And they uh, spent two or three hours together. And what he did is said, you know, I'd like to hear what you guys are up to. And in the process, they said, well, what are you up to? And he identified himself, I am here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ that brings hope to hurting and broken people, forgiveness of sin, and new life in Jesus Christ. That's what I'm here for, and I want to build a community that works into our neighborhood to build this neighborhood so people feel safe in our neighborhood, no matter who they are or what their circumstance is. We want to stand against bullying, we want to stand against street crime, we want to stand for good community life. Well, what he did was, except for the LGBT thing, he just named the Q Center's agenda. And he said, we're absolutely with you. Is he telling the truth when he says we share that agenda? Well, of course he is. Of course he is. But the fact that he went and spoke it first gave them a connection of commonality despite the fact they're on opposite sides of issues of gay marriage and that sort of thing. And they didn't pretend, we didn't, Tim didn't make nice. And there's lots of stuff they don't agree on. But they began by talking to each other, looking for points of commonality, and what I hope will happen as this goes on is Tim will be able to, because, and others, when just Tim, uh, we'll be able to talk to these folk, and we'll develop a relationship like this. Jesus, oh, yeah, Jesus with the tax collectors and the sinners. Why is Jesus there with the tax collectors and sinners? Why do they invite him to their party? Does he walk and insult them? You filthy sinners, let me tell you how you sinned, you know. That's what we tend to do when you get together with folk like this, is we tend to come in and convict them of their sin, taking the Holy Spirit's job to ourselves. When Jesus approaches this kind of stuff, I don't think he comes in and convicts them of sin, drags their sin right on the table. Let me talk to you about the evils of homosexuality, opening line for the relationship. Or they say, let me tell you about the evils of your homophobic Christianity that does not believe in equal rights for people. That's not the place you begin. Jesus apparently was a good guy at a party with tax gatherers and sinners. Was he affirming their sin? In no way. But neither was he beginning by insulting them or calling them idiots or something like that. I think we need to do that kind of thing and not ever pretend that we're on the same agenda on some of the issues. Other issues were exactly on the same agenda. Sam Adams is the mayor of Portland. He's the first gay mayor of a major city in the United States. Uh, New Orleans has an openly gay mayor uh, since that. And Sam Adams uh, is politically, gosh, there's a lot of differences, but he also has a lot of places where we agree on agendas. And what we've done is we have come in to work with 
uh, Sam Adams. He is not Christian in any sense. Uh, but we have worked with him uh, to work with him in issues of common things. So one of the things we're doing, we, I'm speaking for evangelical churches in Portland, we have decided to do what Palau is calling season of service. It's an amazing thing where we serve our community. We do it in public schools, we do it in community parks and things like that. So we go into the public schools and we just bless them. We just bless them. In my church, we connect with East Gresham Elementary School, which is down the street from our building. And the, the current principal there is not a believer. Uh, she's not a bad person or anything, but she has no interest in Christianity. She absolutely loves us. Because we come in and just do all kinds of stuff that they don't have the money to do anymore. We come in and, I mean, we do cleanup type stuff. This past August, they got ready for fall term. We went to her and we said, would you please go to each teacher and have them list down a, a list of dreams for their classroom and give us that list? And so she did. And we got a list of dreams and we went in and we did a bunch of those dreams in the classroom and then went into the faculty lounge and completely redecorated and painted it without them asking for it. They were just, what is wrong with this place of people? What are they doing? What is their agenda? Our agenda is to serve our community in the name of Jesus Christ. So that principal, not a believer, came to our service after school began this year, and this happened times before, and she just came and said, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And Rhonda Patrick, who's our community students and children's and family pastor, prayed for her in front of the entire church. You know, put her hand on her and prayed for her. This woman is not a believer at all. She sure likes Christians now, at least us band of Christians. I think we should be doing that kind of stuff. We do backpack blessings. East Gresham is one of the poorest schools in the, in the area. We discovered 80% of the kids at East Gresham Elementary are in the lunch, free lunch, free breakfast program. 80% of the kids are on free lunch, free breakfast. That means basically they eat, their food comes from the public school. What do they do on the weekend? What do they do on the weekend? And the answer is, we don't know. So we asked through the counselor, would you just kind of check around and find out what kids do? These are elementary school kids. What do they do on the weekend? And what we discovered is basically they're on their own. They're on their own. So we said, well, that's no good. So I don't know. I don't know that Rhonda got the idea originally, but she certainly is trampling it. So we have backpacks, and we fill the backpacks full of food that kids can deal with. Now we don't fill it with food they want, I should say, but stuff they can deal with. It doesn't have to be cooked. So it's boxes of mac and cheese. Anybody can do mac and cheese and peanut butter and that kind of stuff in small packets. And we give them to the kids on Friday. We actually take them to school, and the school gives them to the kids. And then they take them home, and Monday they bring the backpack, or maybe Wednesday they bring the backpack back, and we refill them for the following weekend. And that's just the way it is. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? We just want to show them that we love and care. Compassion. We're involved in many churches. Our, our group is called Compassion Connect. It's a ministry in Portland. We do free medical clinics in the poor area of our thing. And we have a number of medical people in our building, uh, in our congregation, and we go out and we just serve the community with medical clinics. And there are no gospel brochures. I think they don't have any church names there. It's Compassion Connect, which is a kind of generic name. But anybody, wow, what are you guys up to? They can figure out pretty quickly who's involved in this stuff. We don't hide it, but we don't flaunt it. Why? We want to serve and care for our community. Now, I'm probably telling stuff over here that's not that unusual. A lot of you from small towns are like, duh, of course we help out the schools. But for a big city like Portland, this is pretty amazing. Uh, and we're doing it simply because we love Jesus. And what we're believing and what we're finding is that our community can't figure us out. They can't figure us out. Everybody has an angle. 
what is your angle? And we say, well, our angle, I guess if you want an angle, it's Jesus. Because he went out and had compassion for the crowds who didn't have food. We have compassion. I want to know more about this Jesus guy. We'll be glad to tell you about him. And we've had a, we have a community garden by our building. And it was very fun. This is a lousy year. Season was late. We didn't get much out of the garden. A year ago, uh, our first year with a community garden, uh, we had a non-believer who was getting some stuff from our community garden who invited one of her neighbors to get stuff from the community garden, and the neighbor became a Christian. We've got non-Christian missionaries working out of our building. I mean, it's great. Uh, And that's the way it should be. This is partnering with the world. Now, something that just happened, it happened, well, a week ago now, uh, there's a thing going on in Portland we just call Seven. It's basically seven churches getting together on seven Wednesday nights at the seven churches to pray. And that's basically all they do at these meetings is pray. And the seven pastors give a brief, brief, read it, brief word of encouragement. They sing a song, and then they just pray. Uh, it's, it's great. And these are various churches from all over the uh, city of Portland. And at a week ago at River West, which is in Lake Oswego, southwest Portland, uh, they invited Sam Adams. Who's he? Mayor of Portland. Christian? Not even slightly. First openly gay mayor of Portland. We invited him. I wasn't there, but uh, they invited him to come and address as one of these brief words. And he got up in front. I mean, we've done a lot of stuff with Sam. Uh, And he came which is kind of surprising at one level, not at another level. And he came up in front, and what he said basically to the people who are gathered, the building is absolutely packed. I don't know how many people there are, seven, 800 people, and they're there to pray. Sam Adams stood up in front and broke down as he said, thank you for supporting me. He is getting spears put in him by everybody in the world right now because he's a lame duck mayor, and he's done some really dumb things. And... Uh, and he is just getting ripped by everybody. And we don't pretend to agree with him on stuff, but we help him as best we can in issues of common agenda, and there are quite a few of them. And we don't pretend to agree with him on everything. I mean, I haven't done it, but others have. You know, write him a letter. You're, this is so wrong, it can't even be thought of as right. You're such an idiot. You're welcome to my house anytime, come on over, we'll have coffee. See, it's not a personal agenda. We love him. We just disagree with him on some stuff. But we begin by serving him and supporting and building common agendas. And from that basis, we get a lot of opportunities to talk about Jesus. I would love it. I would love it if Sam Adams would become a Christian. He was hugely, hugely impacted because before he became mayor, while he's in the election campaign, he got to dinging around with a 17-year-old male aide in a bathroom. What do we call that? Gross, sad garbage. He was accused of it by one of his competitors, denied it, and ripped the guy for, you're playing dirty politics, except it wasn't dirty politics, it was true. And it came out later, and not only had he done it with an underage guy, uh, but he had lied about it. And there were two recall campaigns to get him dismissed as mayor. And the Portland Mercury, which is the gay rights newspaper, came out strongly against him because they were so outraged that you, Sam Adams, have been our hero and you play into all the gay s- stereotypes. And they were just outraged. And man, it was, it was savage what they did to Sam Adams. It was amazing. In that same time, season of service gathered through various things, $130,000. I mean, it's a lot of money, $130,000. And they invited Sam to one of their meetings, and he came, and they gave him a check to the city of Portland for $130,000. Do whatever you want. No strings. Use it for bettering our city. And Sam just didn't know what to do with it. I mean, he knew it was coming, but still, publicly, to do that is just amazing. Luis Palau, 
great evangelist, international evangelist, I mean a strong, strong man, had personal interactions with Sam Adams that they will not talk about, except the fact that they happened, because Sam mentioned it in that time. He turned to Luis, who was there, and said, uh, Mr. Plow, I just want to thank you for being a pastor to me in this crisis. And that's all he said. I have no idea what happened. Nobody does. It's strictly personal between Luis Palau and Sam Adams. But it was done because instead of zapping him, they cared for him where they could in common agendas. I think that's what we should be doing as a church. And church is. This isn't just one church. It's churches working together. And uh, what happens in those kinds of things is when the tough times come, and they do, is we have a common community agenda. We know where we're different. We don't even pretend to agree on stuff we disagree on. But we work together for common agendas, and we come in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's amazing what happens. Absolutely amazing what happens. That's what Jesus does, I think, here. And I, I think that's what we should be doing is eating together with Catholics and Gentiles, caring for them as human beings, agreeing where we can agree in community issues, disagreeing openly but not judgmentally, uh, and then trying to stand firm in relation to some of the agendas they're doing that are just immoral in my judgment. Uh, and we do. And then how you do that in a caring way without just playing political power, well, that's a... That's another discussion. I think that's a good thing to do. We can partner together in some areas. I'm actually more willing, myself, I'm more willing to work together with a, a guy like Sam Adams than I am to deal with some of the semi-cult religious organizations. Because what happens in the religious organizations, they're trying to use our good name to promote their heresy. And uh, because most people can't tell the difference between the two. They think that, well, okay, I can go to this church and it's okay. And they're, they're Christians like you are. And I'm more worried about uh, her heretical groups, I'll just use that term, be it identified as Christian, than I am s supporting Sam Adams where we just really disagree on a whole bunch of stuff. But let's, let's work for commonality and then from that point of hope and compassion and commonality, we can address our differences and we can come with the forgiveness and hope that comes in Jesus Christ. Pretty amazing stuff. Let me pray. Lord, you are such a troublemaker. You just mess us up because I would like very much not to eat with tax gatherers and sinners. I'd rather eat with good friends like these folk where we share so much in common, where we can talk openly and laugh about grace and and forgiveness that comes in Jesus Christ. And when I'm together with folk like this, they don't like a lot of stuff that I stand for, and they make fun of me and things I stand for sometimes. But I want to be like you, Jesus. I want to be somebody who can bring hope and forgiveness and healing of brokenness into the world of tax gatherers, corrupt political officials, Will you, by the power of your Spirit, work in my heart so I can begin to love these people in all of their brokenness and all of their messiness with something of the degree you did, and I can come and bring hope and forgiveness to the sin that they will reveal to me because they sense a caring, compassionate spirit in me. Thank you for dying for our sin, living for our newness, being exalted to the right hand of God above all power and authority, sending your Holy Spirit so that we can come out and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, live in life together as community of spirit, and continue that mission with the hope that we have that comes only because of the work you do, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.